I'm really thankful for all of you being here today, for our honored guests and speakers uh, today as well. We have been talking here at the Matriots and across the state, obviously, about the East Palestine train derailment, about safety in our communities with regard to uh, with regard to trains and and transportation generally, and. And this conversation today is incredibly exciting for us, not only because of the impact that it has on our communities and for women in our communities, but also uh, because the two speakers today ha both had actually today uh, conversations uh, that lead the state in, the, in a better direction with regard to transportation. I'm excited to talk about that throughout our conversation. Um, First and foremost, I want to introduce you to our moderator today, uh, Lucy Getman, uh, who you will see here in a second. I would spotlight them. We'll spotlight them here in a second for the for the, the conversation. Lucy Getman is a Matriots member, is a um, huge supporter of the work we do, and just a dear friend of mine. I'm thankful that you offered to be the moderator when asked. She, she said, okay, sure. Um, Lucy has been, is the immediate... Uh, a past executive director of women in government, but is also an adjunct professor in politics and it, at the American University. Um, and she is, uh, she was this just what, two, three months ago, a, a finalist for the Columbus um, city council appointment. And so I, you know, you are engaged in politics in our community. You are engaged in helping ensure that that women and voices are heard across our city. Um, you lean sometimes dangerously in to the challenges that are placed on us by government. And so I'm thankful to have you lead this conversation with your grace and with your um, just with your your guidance. You are um, just a voice in Ohio government. And so I'm excited to have you here in Ohio politics. We also have with us two of our Matriot, previously endorsed candidates at the Matriots. Um, and so Rep McNally, you can pull up Rep Lauren McNally here. She is representing House District 59, um, a former city councilwoman from Youngstown and, uh, and a Matriots endorsed candidate from this past cycle. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna let them talk a little bit more about their role and how they're engaged in this particular issue. So I don't wanna steal thunder there. But thank you so much, Rep. McNally, for being here with us today at the end of a very long day coming to us from Youngstown already uh, this evening. And she also mentioned to me that uh, the, there's hail and a storm and wind. And so coming to us just through all of those adversities as well. Uh, and we have Rep. Bride Rose Sweeney from House District 16, previously of House District 14, uh, has been a Matriots endorsed candidate as well, and um, has leaned into being a, a representative for her area since 2018. And so I'm so excited to have you both here with us today. You've been voices on the East Palestine train derailment since it happened, uh, and also just real champions for us in transportation across the state of Ohio. So thank you for being here. To our Matriots members and guests who are here, thank you for being here as well. And I hope that um, I'm excited to learn. I have a lot to learn in this area. So I'm I'm going to sit back with all of you and learn from these uh, really seasoned voices about what's happening in Ohio. Can I turn it over to you, Lucy? Sure, sure. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind and gracious introduction. Um, I am humbled. Um, special thanks to Abby for pulling together uh, many of the pieces and parts of this conversation today, and to the entire Matriot staff and the full hive of members and supporters. Um, and this conversation today um, could not be more timely, even though the uh, East Palestine train derailment disaster happened 48 days ago on uh, February 3rd. Uh, there was substantive policy innovation movement today at the Ohio State Independent because of uh, the two legislative leaders we have on the platform today, Representative McNally and Representative Sweeney. So just to sort of set the stage before we start a very rich conversation, which will include uh, questions of Q&A from the audience, uh, I'm just gonna go over a few touch points uh, based on some research in the New York Times. Um, we know that on February 3rd, a train operated by Norfolk Southern Railroad carrying hazardous chemicals and combustible materials derailed 
in East Palestine, Ohio, which sits on the eastern border of the state near Pennsylvania. Um, the derailment ignited a fire that engulfed the town in smoke. Residents in both Ohio and Pennsylvania near the derailment site were ordered to evacuate to, due to the, ris the risk of explosion. And then about two and a half weeks later, the Environmental Protection Agency ordered Norfolk Southern to identify and clean up contaminated soil and water and to reimburse the agency for cleaning along with attending was ongoing. So even though residents were told it was safe to return to their homes, there are in fact lingering health and environmental concerns for residents. And some experts warned that this is one of the biggest environmental disasters in the United States. And we have evidence of that. If you go on Google today and um, search uh, East Palestine train derailment, uh, do, uh, derailment um, you will get 6.5 million hits in less than one second. So it's impossible to overestimate the significant significance of this event for Ohio communities uh, and for the nation. So um, again, this rich conversation with Representative Sweeney and McNally uh, and our audience, uh, I think will uh, bring a lot of this into uh, sharp focus. So, um, Without further ado, let me start with the first question because I would like to hear from um, each of you about your experience of the derailment, what has been the impact on your community and to other communities in and around Ohio. Um, going in alphabetical order, Representative McNally, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, my experience was very, very intimate because I'm, I'm right next door to East Palestine. My district touches um, that East Palestine district. And so my when, when it happened, my very first phone call was to Representative Rob Blaisdell, who represents that area. What do you need? What's happening? How can my district support your district? And there was that mutual aid from the um, health departments, from the first responders, um, from the county commissioners and the engineers, even the public works departments um, had mutual aid interactions on the ground immediately. And so for those first two, two and a half weeks, my role was really of that of the constituents in the area, um, my district and her district on the ground, making sure that the people were being heard, being supported, had, getting their questions answered, um, that all the information that was flowing through was flowing through in the right way, um, and that we were being responsive. At the same time that that was going on, you know, I also needed to work on some stuff in Columbus because it was apparent and immediate, it was very apparent of things that we needed to do at the state house. Um, to change the course of what was going to be a very long and what will be a very long recovery for this town. Um, and so I had a very hands-on experience for those first two, three weeks. Things are starting to kind of slow down a little bit um, from that regard. And now it's, it's more just the constituents um, checking back, double backing. Are you sure we're good? Is there, is there any new information? They're very, very, um, they're very, very needing of information. They just want reassurance and they want to hear it from the people they know, not from agencies that maybe they've never heard of. Um, parts of the, they're a small town, right? So they're very uh, hands-on with their local government. That's who they trust. That's who they want to hear this information from. Um, and they were very overwhelmed by all of the descending people and media uh, that happened in this town. And it got to a point where we really had to ask people to, to back off and to give them some space and to help from a distance um, because it, it had gotten to a point that it was too much and it was, um, not doing, it was not doing anything to help them from a mental perspective. And it was getting in the work of the cleanup honestly, of the people who, the EPA who was on the ground working every single day, um, 
people are just getting in their way. So um, um, that was my experience, uh, again, very hands-on. So I'll, I'll let uh, Rep Sweeney talk about kind of the bigger picture of what the other districts were feeling and hearing, because it definitely had a huge rippling effect. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. After all this time, my apologies. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Representative Sweeney, and um, I just um, really, um, Representative McNally is such such a fantastic representative. It, as you know, a freshman lawmaker to have to deal with that kind of a you know a, a disaster in your county that you represent. She really was a masterclass of working bipartisanly, communicating with our um, our caucus, uh, the other members. Um, so I really cannot praise her enough for, for doing that work, being there for her constituents. And while she was doing that, it, you know, it became uh, clear that, um, you know, this, it's, you know, it impacted her community, the community of East Palestine and that surrounding neighborhood. But obviously there was this recognition of every community in the state of Ohio. I've honestly never had so many phone calls and direct personalized letters to my office of fear, knowing that when that train, you know, it came through Cuyahoga County, it um, went, you know, and, you know, anyone that has crossed a train, looked at train, they were fearful. And at the end of the day, you know, not only looking at that, but this is not a new issue with rail safety. And um, I'm in my fifth year of being a representative. I'm actually in my 10th year of working at the state house. And in my 10 years of being from a staffer to an aide, I've watched the rail unions come before the General Assembly and say, the way that we are transporting, the way that the rail companies have complete control over the safety and the regulations, both on the federal and state level, it is unsafe and something's going to happen. I've heard that for years and years and years. And then having this, this is, wasn't a one-off case. This wasn't a freak accident. Um, this to me was very clearly the um, only natural outcome of lawmakers and of, of not addressing this issue and allowing the rail associations have complete monopoly over the ability to regulate themselves. And so um, from my role for reacting to, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's not in my neighborhood, but my constituents are concerned and trying to act and use that political window to force um, this issue and to try to actually make movements on long, lasting change. We're going to be there to support Representative McNally and Rob Blaisdell to help the continual efforts of you know, East Palestine. I am the ranking member of finance and you know anything we can do, we're going to look at that. We're not going to leave them behind. You know, when the TV crews are gone, we still need to make sure that that community is not impacted detrimentally, but also what can we do to make sure that this never happens again in the state um, to give confidence to every single Ohioan that they don't need to be fearful and that the lawmakers in this state are gonna put their safety above the needs or the wishes and desires of the rail association. So that's kind of um, my role in all this is just really uplifting the work um, and making sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. Um, and your both of your responses lead um, really dovetail with the next question is, of course, what to do short term and long term. And today was a momentous day um, in the House of Representatives. Substantive uh, policy uh, was approved um, by very large margins. And I'd love to give each of you the opportunity to speak to both the resolution that passed and um, also uh, anything you'd like to say about the transportation budget. Uh, Representative Mc, uh, McNally, would you like to talk about um, HR 33? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it was um, it was just an amazing day. It was a really great day for the institution of the house, in my opinion, the way that um, everybody came together in a bipartisan way 
without controversy to just do the right thing and do the right thing by not just East Palestine, but by the citizens of Ohio for the long term. And so, you know, the resolution that Rep Blaisdell and I um, jointly sponsored today that was passed at the House, it was the kicking off point. It was the first piece of legislation that we wanted to get forward to just start the ball rolling on the numerous pieces of legislation that need to happen long term, both at the state hat level and at the federal level, in order to ensure that this doesn't happen again, ensure that if accidents like this do happen, we know we have all the right information and we can respond in a very cohesive and proper manner, and then we can take care of things in the long term. So, you know, that was the biggest point or the biggest point of this, this resolution was to get that conversation started, to tell the federal government, this is what we want. This is um, a piece of what we want. This is fate, part one of a multi-phased, uh, you know, approach that we need to take but let's start somewhere. And this was a great way to, a great place to start. Basically the resolution asks the federal government to let Ohio know, local and state governments know when um, a train carrying hazardous materials traveling through their, their town or state. Um, and it's, it's information the federal government already has because these, um, whenever you're carrying hazardous material, you have to fill out paperwork. You have to file it with the federal government. So it's not putting any kind of undue burden or, or asking them to create some type of new system. It's literally just asking them to give us that information that they already have. Um, and so we also, you know, in part of the, the testimony that um, I gave, I talked about just the idea of hoping that the federal government can, all of the laws that they are reviewing or that they may come up with, that they look at them through the lens of what has happened in East Palestine. And that is how they approach whatever necessary changes they need to make at their level um, as it relates to this incident. Great, thank you so much. And Representative Sweeney, you mentioned that you're a ranking member on finance, but you were also a co-sponsor of the resolution. Um, what, what do you see the role of uh, the state legislature being in, in the months and years to come? Oh, absolutely. And I would I would be remiss to not say that Representative McNally passed her first bill. Some lawmakers never even did do that. She did that within three months um, in a bipartisan fashion. And it's truly remarkable. Um, and I was honored um, to be a co-sponsor when she asked, I said, absolutely, um, we're gonna get that done. Um, but that should not be, go, go without saying, I'll, I'll praise you if you won't do it yourself, but that's a very remarkable thing. Um, so with that resolution, what, with what we find with this issue is there are, real issues with preemption of the federal government. The federal, the FRA are the main regulators because of interstate commerce clauses within the, the US constitution does limit us to a certain degree of what the state can do to con control this. So her resolution is the longest term of saying, we as a state of Ohio, which we don't typically agree on much, are saying coming together and asking you guys to actually fix the, the you know, you guys are the regulators, keep us safe. But what we, what I've heard and what the rail companies have continued to say time and time again, even today, that the state has absolutely no role in regulating and protecting the citizens when it comes to rail safety. That is completely false. And I have worked with our rail unions, some of the most top respected lawyers who actually sue CSX and Northfolk in many of cases and have won, um, who know that case law. And what we did is within the transportation budget um, happened to, you know, in we're in a budget year, we have to have a transportation budget passed by the constitution actually by next week. Um, it kind of was the, um, actually, I believe the morning that the ODOT director was testifying was the day that the derailment happened and maybe right around there. So in terms of the process, it was, you know, we don't need to wait to move these pieces of legislation because these pieces of legislation in different fashions have been in and around the statehouse for over 30 years. When I was uh, 
in my first job ever, I was a LSC fellow for um, I, then minority leader, Penny Yuko, and he was carrying these same bills. And I was the aide who actually was writing the co-sponsor request um, and the sponsor testimony that never got written because it never even had a hearing on it. And there has not been more than one hearing on these pieces of legislation in the entire time I've been here. And so working um, and putting this at the forefront, our caucus came together, wrote a letter, made noise that, and made the argument that there is a space for the state to do that. And we were actually successful for the first time in 30 years of getting real change out of the House. And then even with working with the Senate, showing them uh, working with the Senate uh, Democratic Caucus and also the Republicans, the, the amendments that we were working on that the House didn't accept. And even after much uh, actually surprised on my end, they actually included them and the Senate made it even stronger. And I, there was a lot of people um, that were helping us make those calls, fight this fight. And I will say the Rail Association came in hard. Um, they were using their their um, their power, which they do have power in the state house, um, but it was a lot of individuals who were part of that. So I do just want to thank all the activists who wrote letters, who advocated for these, and I can just briefly go through some of them, but they, I really think, um, will not only protect the men and women who work on our trains every single day, but should give confidence to every single Ohioan that we are taking their safety into consideration over the profits of our, our rail association. So some of the, the amendments that we got in, um, and, and, I, and an important fact that I like to say, the rail associate came in to testify against these and they themselves say that there's a thousand derailments every single year, a thousand derailments. And they were bragging about that because it used to be like 10 times worse. Could you imagine if we had a thousand plane crashes every year, would that be acceptable? Um, and our, you know, our trains are going through our communities every single day. And Ohio actually has the third largest and densest rail network. So we are disproportionate more affected and have it, those derailments happen in our state compared to most other states. So one of the biggest things that actually was a shock to me was um, the way that trail um, associations or companies regulate or know if there's an issue on these trains. These trains can be miles and miles long um, or something called a wayside defect detector. And these defect detectors detect a defect if a train's on fire or hot wheel bearing. There is not one single regulation on the federal or state level. It is completely up to Norfolk Southern to, to say if they're working at all. And so for the first time, the state is going to say that the State Department of Transportation, the PUCO, is actually going to be um, monitoring and regulating and actually testing those defect detectors to actually ensure that they're operational and effective. And not only that, that any time a defect goes off that this state We'll get that information and then we will share it with the federal regulators so when they are not doing uh, practices in the best interest of Ohioans that the federal regulators can actually come in and have swift fines and that the the we have a dedicated state department that will be working with those regulators as well. Something to me that I found completely despicable is a the practice of when these defects goes off the companies receive that information, not the men and work, men and women working on those trains. And I've heard horror stories of crew people who found out that their train was physically on fire by another train passing them. And the company knew about it, but there's no obligation for the company to tell the train members on that train. How absurd is that? I mean, I just found that to be the most disgusting. They have a whole algorithm and system that they wait until it gets to a point before they even tell the workers on the train because they know the workers on the train will stop that train even if they're told not to. And at the end of the day, they're taking into account if they're behind and the cost benefit. And we're talking about people's lives. And so we are mandating that anytime any defect is detected, the human beings on that train need to be notified. And that should give us confidence not only for the safety, but those people, even if their company is telling them to keep going, that we would hope that those are the individuals who would make a judgment call to put the safety of themselves and also all Ohioans over 
a, a calculation behind a computer screen who can be out of state. Uh, that's the individual who may, is making those calls. Another major piece that has been fought for over 30 years is that the rail industry has continuously moved towards eliminating crew members. Um, they want to get to a point where there's only one human being, and I'm sure that if they could, they would get to having no actual human beings on these trains. And what we um, put into law is a requirement that at least two individuals have to be on every single train. We were actually fortunate in the derailment of East Palestine that there was two, two uh, crew people and a trainee and talking to um, the union said, we feel very confident that if there were not actually three people, the derailment could have been worse. The actual mechanics of how when a train is derailing of stopping the train, getting off the train and actually going back and having to decouple the train so not every car is running into that, having those people be able to talk to first responders. Could you imagine if there was one individual on site? Um, and so we, we passed that as well. We also... Um, about getting more information about hazardous materials. And actually we went further saying, the state should know about any hazardous material. If it's planes, trains, automobiles, we should be able to know that so we can make better informed laws because we are completely flying blind. Um, and that's you know the biggest issue here. So um, there's a little bit more, but overall I am just so, um, kind of blown away. We hear about such dysfunction in government and that is, Ohio, as we all know, is no, uh, is not immune to that. But it's unfortunate that it took a major disaster for the governor or for the legislature to move on this, but we should be really proud and um, continue to encourage that type of cooperation and putting people over profits. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great response. Um, both of you talked about the importance of responding to constituents, and certainly there are um, very you know, valid, legitimate concerns for the health and well-being of people who live in or near um, the area of the derailment, uh, to not in addition to uh, people who might be pregnant or um, you know, ha have a generation a generational future due to the uh, unknown long term impact of exposure to these you know hazardous materials and chemicals. So, um, what what are what is each of you hearing about? Uh, again, uh, local. Uh, there, we just had a this substantive conversation about the policy response. Um, what about the um, you know the health? and well-being and the personal and the individual's response going forward. What, um, what do you think needs to be done? Um, you know, we need to monitor their health for the long term, and we need to make sure we're setting aside a fund that Norfolk is funding to pay for any type of health issues that arise out of this in the short term and the long term. And, um, that is something that was discussed within less than a week of this train derailment happening when um, the, the, our Democratic senators um, and myself convened a roundtable with some of the health officials, some of the um, agriculture officials, uh, environmental officials, and we talked and safety services, and we talked about what happened what the response to what happened was and what we should do in the long and short term um, as, as the state to, to have a, a better response if something like this happens. And one of the things was specifically this long-term health monitoring system that um, has been used prior that um, we have in place um, under OSHA for um, our own employees that we can extend possibly to the residents of East Palestine and set something like that up for them. Um, and then, like I said, again, the second phase of um, creating a fund that Norfolk pays into that would take care of medical concerns. Because um, the reality is we don't know what the long-term concerns are going to be. Um, and so monitoring those and, and catching them as soon as we can, if anything does come, does come about in terms of symptoms or anything, 
um, will be the best outcome, will be able to have the best or ensure the best outcome for the residents and their health. Mm -hmm. Great. Representative Sweeney, other thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I um, I would say um, Representative Nally's uh, more um, in, in tune with that, but especially as the ranking member of finance of looking at how we can financially support and um, making sure that it is a priority of not only the health, but also the city itself. And um, that is people's homes and their hometown and making sure that we are supporting them with whatever they need financially now into the future. I think what we see a lot of times with these disasters, it's, you know, Everyone's there when the TV cameras are are on and the spotlight's there. But I know Representative McNally and you know, our caucus will have her back to make sure that we are fighting now and as long as they need additional resources for their health, for the economic viability of their city, to make sure that their safety forces have the right equipment to um, do what they need to do to, to serve the people um, in that community. Great, thank you. Well, we're starting to get some questions in the chat and we will get to them in about five minutes or so, but there are a couple of other questions I'd like to pose um, to our esteemed panelists. Um, both of you have referred to uh, a, a moment of genuine bipartisanship uh, in responding to a situation that has uh, implications for every citizen of Ohio. Um, does this extend to Congress? I understand that Ohio's senators are engaged in uh, a, a statewide response uh, from the perspective of Washington. So um, what reflections do you have on bipartisanship, bipartisanship in Ohio, in Washington, DC on this issue and how might we um, extend that, uh, that culture of bipartisanship going forward? My gosh, that is a really, really heavy question. Um, I, you know, I today was a day on the floor of just genuineness, genuine concern for the citizens of Ohio for what happened to us as a state, um, and and thinking about people first over anything else. And if we continue to do that and put people above anything else, as Rep Sweeney said earlier, people above profit, people above whatever, um, I think that we'll always be able to get to bipartisanship. Um, you know, from talking with some of uh, our railroad union folks who have been working on the federal side, they, this past week, they said they are very hopeful that things look really good with the bills moving through the Senate on a bipartisanship, and they they think that those thing the that bill will get out um, of the Senate with an affirmative vote. Um, but the House is having a little bit more trouble, mostly because they had two versions of of a bill on trying to marry those. Um, but you know, it's been a really good experience as a freshman lawmaker to go to to um, handle this process or be able to handle what's going on uh, because of the support I had from my caucus, from the Senate side of the house and from the Republicans across the aisle. I'm, I'm the only Democrat in the three counties surrounding me. So I'm surrounded by all Republicans. So I, I we had to work together and they it it was a very good experience. It was a very positive experience. They were very willing and helpful and hopeful and um just supportive. And again, I think it's that people over anything else concept that everybody had in mind that got us to that point. Um, but I'm sure Rep Sweeney can give a lot more insight than I ever can since again, I've been on the job, what, 11 weeks now? So <laughs> um, she probably has a lot more thoughts about it. No, and that, she, she Representative McNeil is exactly right. I will say, um, I'm just such a realist. Um, so I'd love to sit here and tell everyone that it was just because everyone truly cares about people over profits. Um, I think for some, I think the reality of 
it did, it had to take a derailment. It had to take a, a disaster to wake people up of that when the unions had been um, coming year after year and saying that something was going to happen for something to happen for them to believe that um, you shouldn't just take everything that the rail associations tell you or the rail companies at, at face value and that there's real people behind the policy that we create. I think oftentimes I find in, in the state house, you know, when we're sitting there slashing numbers, I mean, those are real people's lives when we make massive cuts to government services, when we fail to move things um, through the legislature that is about public safety, that there are real human lives. And I think because this disaster happened and it's, you can see the footprint of all of the rail you know, it, it's real. They were, I think lawmakers were afraid, their constituents were afraid. This wasn't Republican or Democrat, um, but there's definitely one side that definitely was unwilling to ever move that. And I will say on, on our side, we made it a, a, an effort because sometimes it the, the natural um, reaction is we told you so, you guys caused this. It is the lack of the, the majority party who's been in power this whole year. We didn't do that because we knew that as much as we were very tempted as much as I wanted to say that this is your fault this is I don't even necessarily blame Northfolk because we knew better it is our job to keep Ohioans safe it is their job to have profits it is our job to make sure that companies are not uh, taking advantage of of us and making sure and so we you know really thought how can if we actually care about people over everything and at political wins, we came to the Republicans and said, this is our proposal. Let's do it together. We're not going to make this a political football. And um, actually working and um, not hitting them over the head, I think, is why we were able to be so successful. And, um, you know, it was took some convincing from our, even our own Democrats to say, no, it, it's about, you know, we did all the work on this that, you know, we did the Democrats, but from the public, it was, we did this, you know, together, but we couldn't have done it without them. And so it's kind of for not just, you know, I do generally think that there were some people in the majority party who would have never voted for this unless it happened because they, they generally changed their mind. I think there was others that saw that it would have been a, a probably a bad PR look to be the only person voting against real safety when we just had one of the worst disasters. Um, and then it was also the fact that we were willing to come to the table and not make it a political issue. And really what we care about, because that's our job, you know, it's important to run good elections. And if I care about my policies to run that, but at the end of the day, our job as lawmakers is to put policies in place that help people. And I'm really proud of the Democrats and the Republicans um, that did that because um, I'm actually shocked that we've, we've made it this far because I've seen plenty of other issues that you would think are no brainers that just help people that still don't get done. So it's my hope that a lot of people have learned from this and um, that we remember that there's people at every single policy decision we make um, every single week we go down to Columbus. Great. Thank you for that sort of uh, forensic uh, reflection on bipartisanship. And one of my many takeaways from this conversation is that people over everything else should be our guide. Um, well, we do have some time um, for questions. We already have uh, one in the chat. Uh, there's a question about, does OSHA regulate uh, rail employee safety? So I'm not sure if it, the, the big, the, the main regulator is the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, and so they, you know, and there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, the rules that they have put forward and in certain administrations that have been put back. And it's our it's our hope that um, further um, regulation will come from the FRA. So that's kind of the main overseer of directly uh, federal, the, uh, of railroads specifically that's designed about this industry because of the unique nature of what trains are doing. They're, they're moving in between states and they're, I will admit that there are limitations to what we can do. We can't just, you know, stop trains because that has an in impact on commerce throughout the entire economy of the U United States. So they might have a small role, but the, the main focus is the FRA, who is actually 
overseeing their own two person crew. And we can actually hear within the next two months and um, whether or not that that become, could become a law for everyone. And um, again, the FRA only has so much they can do. And that's why we have, you know, Sherrod Brown, Rep uh, Representative Amelia Sykes, working with the Republicans to um, do the pieces that Congress, that's where we get the real hammer, the real protections that we need. And so all of this is going to help. The FRA can do so much. At the end of the day, we have to do it all. Okay. Thank you. Um, Another interesting question in the chat, is our rail system so fragile compared with other countries that these need, needful regulations might cause them to diminish service across the board, or do they make enough profit that the needed regulations won't impact their servicing for the country? Thoughts? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think it's like, as we see with a lot of other major, major uh, profitable um, organizations is that they take into account derailments and it is cheaper for them to be completely unregulated and to do what they want to do to, in order to transport goods in the manner that they so choose, meaning cutting uh, actual human beings out of the process longer train length, faster train uh, speeds. Um, they, I guess this is kind of from my research and I guess my own personal opinion that I, I think that they take into account that it is the profits that they make and the cost, although it will be very expensive with derailments, there's been three derailments this year. Um, Thankfully, not with hazardous materials, but it, they, they take these into account and it is cheaper for them to deal with a derailment than it is to, um, in their mind, to have, say, cut off half of the train length, to slow down their their trains, to um, impede their ability to make as much profit as, you know, transport as much good. And it's important that we have a, a functioning rail system. And I actually found it pretty wild that when the Rail Association was coming in before the Finance Committee, that they said, instead of regulating us, why don't you just fix the rail, the rail system for us? Just pay for it. And I, I, I could not believe that um, they would ask Ohio taxpayers to fix their problem. While the past few years, they spent the majority of their profits uh, or their money on stock buybacks. Um, so that's it's no different than any other um, major corporation in this country that is focused on making money for them and their shareholders and um, will get away with as much as they can while still being able to make profits. Well, Heather has a great observation in the chat and then I'd like to give our um, esteemed panelists uh, an opportunity to make any uh, final comments or if there are any other questions in the chat, we'll, um, we'll air them. But um, uh, Heather observes that Representative McNally noted that people trust their local government in these times of turmoil. However, in this case, local government has very little control or knowledge. So HR 33 is moving the needle on notification, but as this local, this is a local government election year, um, what have we seen from local elected officials uh, that women running for office this year, either mayor, city council, township, trustee, et cetera, can use as good or instructive guidance. That's a great question. Um, I think it, you know, if you're running for local government, um, the biggest thing you need to build is trust. And uh, because you are the one that they can touch, feel, have access to, are always on the ground in that city, in that community. Um, and so people running for local government really need to start there. And they need to start um, with just those, making sure that they're building trust, building communication and enabling it in putting forth actual facts at the local level. Um, and in having the relationships at the other levels to be able to put forth those facts um, because you're gonna be turned to first before anybody else. Um, they have your number more than they have um, Rep Sweeney's number, my number, um, 
although being a former local council person, everybody has my number still too. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's, and then, and then they turn to us next before they get to the federal level, right? So they want to, they're comfortable with the people that are closest to them. And that's your local government. Those are the people that are affecting you every single day. So that's why they turn to them in these times of need and crisis. That puts a lot on their back and that puts a lot of expectation on you um, if you're at that level. And in a case like this, it, it was chaos on the ground for a while. Um, and it was chaos because of the local governments didn't know who to go to, who to talk to. And the um, local responders, um, you know, they didn't even have the right, one of the issues was this, the for the first responders was the radio system. They couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't talk to the other um, first responders coming, coming in to help. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like I went down a tangent and try to circle back to your original question of, of a piece of advice for people running for our local office um, and the issue of, of them really trusting you. Just, just know that they're going to turn to you and you need to be there for them. And those phone calls that you get, sometimes they may seem um, tedious, but they're really important for building that for if the big moments happen. Great. Excellent advice. Thank you. Okay. Um, having see, uh, seeing no other questions in the chat, I'd love, uh, love it if um, uh, you, Representative Sweeney and Representative McNally, would uh, provide us any final thoughts. I, I'll, I'll go first, if that's okay, Rep. Sweeney, um, just because I'm still unmuted here. Uh, but I would I think my final thought, this is a, uh, you know, the Matrix is a women group. And I would be remiss to not say that the women in this situation are the ones that stepped up. The women on the Senate, the women like Rep Sweeney, Rep Blaisdell, our leader Russo, we were the ones that moved first. We were the ones that took the initiatives first and and took and started doing the work that needed to happen both on the ground with our constituents, but also at the state house um, and through legislation. And so like kudos to the women who really hit the ground running when this happened. And I'm really grateful for everybody who sort of picked up different pieces without even needing to be asked, without even needing to have um, that conversation of what do you need me to do? They knew what to do and they just took off and ran with what what um, what needed to get done. And I just think it was just a great testament to the fact that women rolled their sleeves and work. And I was and I was just really proud. And I was proud today um, on the floor with just two women carrying this um, resolution and with Rep Sweeney carrying the transportation budget. Um, it was exciting as a, as a fellow female to see that happen, to see the women take charge in this situation. Thank you. Yeah, I would just um, echo that. And I think maybe it's part of, because I know it looks like Grace says, why was that? And the men were very supportive, especially in our Democratic caucus. So I don't want to throw them under the bus. But I will say, I think it's maybe also that it's not just about having an idea. It's about doing it and doing it just to get it done. And again, not about doing it for the press releases or do, doing it to show people we were right or it was we just need to work with whoever we need to and be humble about it and not care about who's doing what we just need to get it done and I think that's maybe a characteristic that is more common in in, in females and, and really that um, community that we have of um, I couldn't imagine being a freshman lawmaker or even if that would have happened to me, how much I would have struggled with my community about being there and being able to handle, uh, you know, the pressures of responding and being there. And, you know, you know, I just, I was even remarked about how many people were driving up and helping Representative McNally and understanding that 
and not trying to do it for the TV cameras or to be there on their social media. It was just to be there for her and to let her know what's best for her community. And honestly, I think, you know, I will say that, you know, there was a point when this was in the Senate that we kind of got word that they were going to strip all of these out. And, you know, I, I was, I've talked to other panels and, you know, a lot of people at the end of the day, it can be, and I know everyone on this call has been activists, has, has done the work. And I really just want um, everyone to know that it is exhausting work um, to fight for democracy, to fight, to have women, to have their place. Um, but it does sometimes work. And I will say that if it wasn't for groups like yours who pay attention, who care enough to even be on a Zoom call at, you know, almost six o'clock on a Thursday that care about their communities, um, that's the only reason why this it gets done. We can't do this without having an army behind us. And I think they knew that, honestly, um, a lot of people just didn't want the political pushback of voting against it. And I think that pressure only comes because of you guys. And so thank you for everything you do and will do to ensure that we have, you know, a fair government that's working for the people. And um, I think that you guys should also take this as, you know, a reminder that it, it does matter. So thank you all. Well, thank both of you and your comments. Um, well, first of all, let me say you're getting a lot of love in the chat. People are absolutely, um, you know, uh, you knocked it out of the park and you've got a lot of gratitude and appreciation in the chat. So thank you. And um, your comments, um, Rep Sweeney, are the perfect uh, lead in to uh, turn the program uh, back over to our uh, CEO, Emily Quick Shriver, uh, to kind of wrap up because um, this really is about the army of women who are changing the political landscape in Ohio. So thank you both very much. And back to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Lucy. Oh my goodness, I have been just, I have been making so many notes over here. This was fantastic. This was fantastic. Not only educational and telling us, you know, what happened, where were we, where were each of you, where were your teams, but how we make things better for Ohio. Um, and for um, one thing that we've been really focused on is putting people first, right? That women legislators, women elected officials put the people in their community first and you know the power the politics the 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 profits as rep mcnally said second or third or four, further down because the people are what matter and thank you so much for reiterating that for us today this powerful conversation is um, is instructive to us for why we continue to do the work that we do. I will tell you, it is exhausting. I know I feel it. I feel it for you. I feel it with you. And I know that our members do as well. And so thank you for, um, for bringing this, this conversation to the forefront today. I also noticed this week, and maybe you did as well, the stark difference between the federal presentation and federal conversation that happened um, about the East Palestine issue and that it was a, a bunch of men having a conversation at the federal level on this, presenting on this versus the women who are actually doing the work here in the state of Ohio. Just that, that very stark difference between today's work in the Ohio legislature versus yesterday's uh, presentation in Congress. And so thank you for highlighting that and for being with us today. You are making a difference. You're making it better for Ohio. And we are thankful for you because of that. Um, we are here for our candidates. We're here for the women that we support running for office. Um, and um, it's the reason we, we, we work so hard at what we do. So thank you for bringing your voices to this conversation today. Um, I, I can't wait to just distill down even more of what you've said um, and take it back to the folks who are running this year as well. So thank you for this work. Um, to our members and to our friends out there um, on Facebook or wherever you happen to be, if you liked what you saw, please make sure that you support the Matriots. Go to www.matriotsohio.com. You can learn more about us. You can help support the work that we do. We need, um, we need to be able to keep doing presentations like this, but also to support our the, the candidates and the work that they do. So thank you so much. I love it. it says women govern differently. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, she knows it from firsthand knowledge, but also um, we see it every day. And thank you for putting us first. Um, I hope that you all have a wonderful evening. I saw a tiny human in 
Rep McNally's background. So off everyone goes to your evenings, to your people. Um, and, uh, and let's keep doing the good work of the place ever onward, everybody. Thank you. Have a great night.